Today we're going to be doing something new. We're going to be using, well, just let me show you. See, I'm looking for my stylus. There's my stylus. Whew. Life would have been hard without my stylus. Okay. We're going to use a method called synthetic division. Now, up until now, the way we've shown, and what this says is determine whether the numbers are zeros of the polynomial. Up until now, the way we've shown whether or not a number is a, um, a, um, a zero of a polynomial is we have taken that number, plugged it in for X, calculated the answer, and if the, if the answer is zero, then that number is a zero of F of X. Pretty easy, but just stop and consider. The longer these polynomials get, the more abusive the whole process is. There has to be something easier. And so, or there doesn't have to be, but hopefully there is, and there is. There's a method called synthetic division, which is much easier than substituting these numbers for X. Now, maybe it's not that much easier with a short polynomial, but we're gonna be working on a quartic today, okay? And that's pretty darn long. So you're gonna be glad that we have synthetic division. Here's how you do it. Here are our, our test numbers right here. We're going to see if negative five is a zero of f of x equals two x to the third plus seven x squared minus nine x plus 30. Then we're going to see if two is a zero of f of x. But we're going to use a quicker method, an easier method called synthetic division. All you have to do is, is multiply, add, and subtract, which I suppose is all you have to do if you plug the number in for X, but think about the errors you can make. Like for instance, if you don't put parentheses around a negative five and you use your calculator, you're going to get the wrong answer. So it's easier to get the correct answer this way. Here's how you do synthetic division. I'm going to try the number negative five. Well, come on now. Be nice to me, talking to the computer. I, I take my negative five and I put it in this kind of backward L thing. I have never, in all my years teaching math, studying math, I have never known what to call that. Then, just like with um, um, matrices, remember way back to matrices, where you use the coefficients of the X's, that's what we're gonna do now. So I am going to use a two from there, and then a seven, and then a negative nine, and then a 30. Don't worry, this is not, this is not a, um, um, a matrix, but I have my computer on in the other room and it's making noise and it also is cutting down on the bandwidth that I need. So I'm gonna go turn it off. There now. I was listening to a true crime podcast before 
I started recording. All right, here we go. Now I'm going to, after I've done this, I'm going to draw a line like we do when we say like three plus two equals five, that kind of line, an equals two line. Now my first step is to take this first number, whatever it is, and bring it straight down and write it down here. That's what I do. Then I take that number and I multiply it by the number in the backwards L, my test number. So two times negative five is negative 10. I write negative 10 under the next number seven. Negative 10. Now I add seven plus negative 10 and I get negative three. Now, I take negative three, the new number here that I just got from adding these, negative three and I multiply it by negative five, just like I took the two and multiplied it. Negative three times negative five is positive 15. Negative nine plus positive 15 is what? 16. Is that right? No, is 6. 6 times negative 5 is negative 30. 30 plus negative 30 is 0. Now, when you're looking for the zeros of functions, this is exactly what you want to have happen. Your last number has got to be a zero. That shows that negative five is a zero of the function. Negative five is a zero of f of x. It's as easy as that. Now I was going slow because I'm assuming you don't you do not know this method yet. But imagine how fast you can get. Let's get fast on number two. Two right there. That's our other test number. So two in the backwards L, then two, seven, negative nine, and 30, and draw a line. Skip a line there because you end up writing numbers there. Bring the first number directly down. Two times two is four. 7 plus 4 is 11. 11 times 2 is 22. Negative 9 plus 22 is 22. Ah, I'm not thinking today. Okay. Negative 9 plus 22 is 13. 13 times 2 is 26. 30 plus 26 is not 0. It's 56. What this shows is that 2 is not a 0. of f of x.
OK, that's our method. It's not hard, but sometimes you have to be careful. Let's do another one. And here you've got to be a little careful. This is a cubic polynomial and I'm going to divide it by X plus two. So there are a couple of things we need to know. What I'm really being asked to do is to do long polynomial division which is something we're definitely not going to do in this class. If I had more time, I would. We're being asked this to do this, x plus 2 into x cubed minus 3x squared minus 7 now, the reason I skipped a place is because normally you've got a number times x to the third and a number times x squared, and we have both of those. We have 1x to the third minus 3x squared, but we're supposed to have a number times x, and we don't. So I have to put it in. I have to put in a placeholder 0 times x and then minus seven. Now, why do I have to do that? Because I have to account for every position of the polynomial, every degree of the polynomial, every degree of each term in the polynomial in descending order. It has to be there. Even though zero times X is zero. So all I'm adding to this polynomial is zero. Which is not changing it. You've still got to put a placeholder in. And then we're being asked to do long polynomial division, which looks hard if you haven't done it before. And it can be tricky. Easier way. First stop and think. We have used the factor formula. F of X equals A times X minus Z1 times X minus Z2, so on and so forth, right? This is a factor in this kind of form. This is in the form of X minus Z. X minus is zero. So what I'm going to do is put this X plus two. Oh, that's a two. X plus two in that form right there. How can I make it look like that? Well, if I have X minus negative two. So the zero in this is negative two. Another way to do this is to set X plus two equal to zero and solve for X. So you'll get X equals negative two. Now, why am I doing that? I'll show you. Because what they're asking me to do here, let's read the whole thing. Use synthetic division to find the quotient and the remainder. Okay, the quotient is what you get up here when you divide. And the remainder is what's left over. My beloved leftovers, I love leftovers. Leftovers always taste better than the original food because it's had time for the spices to get into it. Provided 
you haven't left it as a leftover for too long. Don't do that. Anyway, I have two things here that make this tricky. First, I have to change that to a test number. To do that, I do either this method so that my test number is negative two, or I use this method so that I know my test number is negative two. Then I come over here and I put negative two, not positive two, in the backwards L. Then, since I'm supposed to be dividing this into this, what I'm going to use is the coefficients of this. A 1, a negative 3, a 0 for the placeholder, and a negative 7. Now I'm ready to use synthetic division. This time to find the quotient and the remainder. I skip a line and draw a line. I bring the first number directly down. One times negative two is negative two. Negative three plus negative two is negative five. Negative 5 times negative 2 is positive 10. 0 plus 10 is 10. 10 times negative 2 is negative 20. Negative 7 plus negative 20 is negative 27. This is your remainder. Except, I was always taught, and I don't think it's important at all, um, to make it a dashed line. Like I said, it's not important. But what this does is it does separate your last number down here. This is the remainder. When the remainder is zero, it means your test number is a zero of f of x. When the remainder is not zero, it means your test number is not a zero of f of x. So I now know that we're not being asked, but just so you know, negative two is not a zero of this number that we're dividing into. Well, big deal. You're not being asked about it anyway. Now watch what I do. We are being asked for the quotient. How do you find the quotient? That is, if you were doing long division, that would be the part that goes up here. Like 5 into 313. Remember long, long uh, number division in arithmetic. 5 won't go into 3, but it will go into 31 6 times. 6 times 5 is 30. 31 minus 30 is 1. Bring down the 3. 5 will go evenly into 13 2 times to make it 10. 13 minus 10 is 3. This is an example. Let me write that because I want to keep it. This is your quotient right there. This is your remainder. So you've been dealing with quotients and remainders for many, 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 many years. Probably more than you'd like to think about. Well, this is the remainder here, negative 27. So let's write a place for quotient. And 
and then you'll have an answer box and a place for the remainder and you will have an answer box. The remainder is negative 27. What about the quotient? Here's how you figure that out. Okay, this was what we were first dealing with. 1x to the third minus 3x squared plus 0x minus 7. This was a cubic. After you do synthetic division, you have one power lower. Well, 3 minus 1 is 2. So this is 1 x squared, and then the powers go downhill, descend. This is 1x squared minus 5x plus 10. So in here I'll put x squared minus 5x plus 10. So this part is your quotient. This part is your remainder. Just like over here, when you divide, the answer is a quotient, well, that part of the answer is a quotient. And if you have a remainder, well, that's the remainder. Same thing. When the remainder is zero, it's much better. Okay, now feel free to speak up. These show you how to do the basic, um, the basic job you're going to be doing, which is to use synthetic division to find the zeros of a function. However, it can also be used as an easier alternative to long polynomial division, which nobody really likes. Now we're going to do a real problem. This is a rational zeros theorem problem that brings everything you've been learning for the last week together. The week before finals and this. All of this function behavior stuff, it's all leading up to this. Here you've got f of x. Doggone it. F of X equals X cubed plus 7X squared minus 5X minus 35. And you're being asked to find the rational zeros that is numbers like one, two, three, or zero, or negative one, negative two, negative three. Those are integers, they're rational. Or two thirds or negative five eighths, those are rational. They're actually rational. And these are examples of rational numbers. Let me put that notation. Examples. Of. 
of rational numbers. Okay, that's what we're looking for first. Then we're going to find any other zeros. Now, how do you do that? Well, you, you use the quadratic formula. That's how you find non-rational zeros. So what we have to do is use synthetic division to get this cubic function down one level to a quadratic and then use the quadratic formula. That's our strategy every single time. All right, so what do we do first? Here's what we do first. We're going to talk about a new theorem. And here it is. f of x equals 1, x to the third plus 7x squared minus 5x minus 35. And you could actually use grouping to solve this. To find the zeros, rather. But we're not going to, we're going to be tough here. All right. I'm going to use the rational zeros theorem, but, but it is lovingly called the P over Q theorem. What P is, very important, P is all the factors I should have said the set of, but it's all the factors of the constant of f of x. That is that, okay? Positive and negative. So P is going to be plus or minus all the factors of 35. Well, let's see. The factors of 35. All I have to do is find the positive ones because I'm stipulating over here that I want the positives and the negatives. All right, 35 is one times 35 and five times seven, and that's it, my goodness. All right, so I'm gonna write them in order because it's easier on me and you, the, the user. It actually ends up being easier, as you will see if you have them in order. So one, five, seven, and 35. That's what my P numbers are. Now, this becomes plus or minus one, plus or minus five, plus or minus seven, and plus or minus 35. What about Q? We gotta have a Q. Q. Q is all the factors all the integer factors. I can keep thinking of ways to make this longer, <sighs> but it's all the integer factors of the leading coefficient.
which here is just a one. So Q is just plus or minus one. Go figure. Now, here is something you have to remember. There is never a guarantee that a polynomial will have rational zeros. There is no guarantee Kind of have to live on the edge here. However, there's a however there. How, how e ever, if there are rational zeros, They will be found in the set of P over Q. Well, all right then. Let's be for finding all the possible rational zeros if they exist with no guarantees. No, three isn't in there. Keep wanting to put it in. It's not. One, five, seven, and 35 over plus or minus one. Well, any number over one is just itself. So our P over Q set is going to consist of plus or minus one, plus or minus five, plus or minus seven, plus or minus 35. That only happens when your leading coefficient is one. Which doesn't always happen. All right, if there are rational zeros, if, I'll find them there. How do I know? Well, I could test each one of those numbers using synthetic division, which is what my algebra teacher in high school used to do to us. Um, however, in this age of calculators, we can graph the function and we can look for numbers in here that might match up with zeros on the x-axis. 
So let's do that. Go to y equals, we'll have x caret 3 plus 7x squared minus 5x minus 35. Now this is a positive cubic, so its end behavior is up on the right and down on the left. And so we have this coming from down here, up, turning around, coming down, turning around, going up forever. And these are where the graph crosses the x-axis. Now it looks for all the world like negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven is a zero. That doesn't mean it really is, but it might be. In which case, I'll be able to reduce this cubic to a quadratic and then use the quadratic equation. Meanwhile, I will have a rational zero. Negative seven is in the pool of all possible. These are the P over Q's. These are all possible rational zeros. If they're not in this group, they don't exist. Okay, so negative seven is definitely there. Let's try it. Negative seven. Now I'm gonna write the coefficients. One, seven, negative five, negative 35. One, seven, negative five, negative 35. Notice that I have all my, all my terms. I have a third degree, second degree, first degree, zero degree terms. So I've got all of the terms accounted for. I don't have to put in a placeholder. I skip a line, draw a line. I bring down the first number. One times negative seven is negative seven. Seven plus negative seven is zero. Zero times negative seven is zero. Negative five plus zero is negative five. Negative five times negative seven is positive 35. Negative 35 plus positive 35 is zero. Yay, I have a zero remainder. Woo! That means that negative seven is a rational zero. Of F of X. Meanwhile, let's look at the quotient. This was X to the third. So the quotient is one going to be one degree lower, X squared. So what I have is X squared plus zero X minus five. Let's write it down. X squared plus zero X, that's just zero, minus five. Let's set that equal to zero and see what other answers we get. Here, that term is missing. The first degree term is missing, the linear term. 
So what we're going to do is, is use the square root principle instead of the quadratic formula. Add five to both sides. x squared equals 5. Take the square root of both sides, because nobody cares what x squared equals. They want x. Remember to put your plus or minus. The square root of x squared is x. So, plus or minus the square root of 5 are going to be your other zeros. That's how they're referred to, the other zeros. Other zeros. So what are the zeros of our function? You're gonna have answer boxes to fill in and uh, the rational zeros with the S in parentheses, negative seven. The other zeros, negative the square root of five and positive the square root of five. Now let's look back up and see what all we're being asked to do. There's one more step. Factor f of x into linear factors. Well, we know how to do that too. We use our factor factory. f of x equals a times x minus z1 times x minus z2 times x minus z3 because it's a cubic, right? The whole idea is to take this cubic x to the third plus 7x squared minus 5x minus 35 and write it in factored form. Okay, well, some things we already know just from looking at this. The leading coefficient, a, is one. Okay, let's write that down. This is going to be one. And there are gonna be three zeros because it's a cubic aside from the fact that that's how many we found. One, two, three. So I can let Z1 equal negative seven, doesn't matter. Z2, you could put them in a different order if you wanted to. And Z, uh, uh, uh. don't I wish, no. Negative the square root of five and Z3 is positive the square root of five. Okay, I come down here and I put those guys into this formula. Let me mark through the A there, now that we know it's a one. We're going to have X minus negative seven, X minus negative the square root of five, and x minus positive the square root of five. So let's clean it up. If there's a one there, it becomes invisible. This is going to be x plus seven times x plus the square root of five times x minus the square root of five. 
So that's what f of x equals in factored form. Ta-da! And that is the entire problem. So let me make this bigger. And then let me make it smaller so you can get an overview. What you're asked to do with these problems is find the rational zeros and then the other zeros of a polynomial function. That's what f of x equals zero means. It means you're finding the zeros. Then you use those zeros to factorize the polynomial. And if you were to decide to multiply these three factors together, you would get x to the third plus 7x squared minus 5x minus 35. So first, what do you do? The first step, find all possible rational zeros, if they're there. You have to have your set of all possibles. Okay. Then step two is not shown, but what you do is you graph f of x. Um, you graph f of x um, to see if any of the x-intercepts because that's really what you're looking for. Remember the zeros are the x-coordinates of the x-intercepts. Um, if any of the x-intercepts match the numbers in the P over Q set. And I graphed it and I found negative seven. That was a good guess. Now three, test your good guess. That's what a hypothesis is. Test your good guess. Well, that's what I did. Negative seven was a guess. I didn't know for sure. After this, once I got a zero remainder, I was sure. Yes, negative seven is a rational zero. Then four, find the other zeros. And when they say other, they mean the non-rational zeros.
and then five if it's asked for, and it will be. Um, write this in factor form. Write f of x in factored form. Now we're going to apply those steps to a quartic polynomial. Here we have find the rational zeros and then the other zeros of the polynomial function. The polynomial function is f of x equals x to the fourth minus 11x to the third minus 53x squared minus 67x minus 26. Okay, the leading coefficient, the Q number in this case, is going to be 1. And P is 26. Because in order to find the rational zeros, we have to find all the candidates. Which is not quite as painful as watching all those debates on television during an election year. Okay, so. So here's step one. We're going to get our P over Q's. P is going to be the set of all the factors of 26. So 26 is going to equal 1 times 26 and 2 times 13. And not much more than that. So plus or minus 1, 2, Thir excuse me, 13 and 26. Q, meanwhile, is just plus or minus 1. And so, P over Q is going to be the plus or minus 1, 2, 13, and 26 over plus or minus 1. Almost not necessary to do that when the leading coefficient is 1. And so what will that give us? That will give us all the possible rational zeros, that is plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 13, plus or minus 26. Okay, step two, graph. This time I'm going to actually put the graph on the page. Okay, let's pull it over. Come on, over here. Clear. Clear. All right, X to the fourth x caret 4 come down minus 11 x to the third x caret 3 come down minus 53 x squared minus 
53 x squared minus 67 x minus 26 and minus 26 minus 67 x minus 53 x squared minus 11 x to the third x to the fourth okay Okay, that's all we see. Um, there might be, there might be two factors. There might be two um, uh, zero x-intercepts or zeros there, um, which would make one, two, three. However, this is x to the fourth, and right now it looks like it has the wrong end behavior, a negative x to the third end behavior. So I am. Bet it, shouldn't bet, but I am, that since um, positive and negative 26 are in the batch of all possibles, that I need to expand my window at least for a minute to see where those other zeros might be or the other zero. So instead of going negative 10 to 10 on the x-axis, I'm going to go negative 30 to 30 just temporarily because I want to see if 26 is in hiding or maybe 13 or negative 13. So negative 30 to positive 30. Aha, there was another one out there. And it looks like, I mean, if it were if it were positive 26, it would be farther out here. So I bet that's 13. So now I'm going to I'm going to improve my window. I just wanted to see. You can't know everything. This is called hidden behavior. You have to kind of check all your bases. OK, now window. I now am going to go to, since I know there's nothing out here, I'm going to go to negative 5 for x min. That's the left boundary. And the right boundary I'm going to let be 15. Ooh. My, there, there it is, right there, see it? Okay, now I've got to do one more thing. It looks like this comes up and kisses the x-axis and goes back down, which means it would be a zero with multiplicity two. I don't know if that's true, so I need to get a better view of what's going on over here. So I'm going to change my window again to just get, just for a minute, to get a, um, a close-up view of that. Because you've got to be sure with this stuff. Okay, so what am I going to change my window to? Negative 5 to 0. Okay. Nope, that's not close enough. Okay. Window. Negative 1, negative 2, maybe negative 3. I'm going to change to negative 3. And then I'm going to let x max be negative 0.5, which is negative 1 half. Okay. 
dog. I've got to see if that's one or two X intercepts. I think it's two. So one more time, one more time. I'm going to change my left boundary to negative one and a half. I've got to get a better view of this. I've got to, got to, got to. So negative 1.5 to 0.5. And I'm going to make this negative 2. That's how high, how low it's going to be, how high it's going to be, just so that we can get a real close view of this. Aha, aha, look at that. It does come a little bit above the X axis. So I'm gonna do something that seems really wild here. Negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. That is now the height is uh, one half unit below that, the height the vertical dimensions, one half unit below the x-axis to one half unit above the x-axis. Um, as far to the left as I go is negative one and a half, and as far to the right as I go is negative 0.5. Let's see what happens. Woo! Woo! See that? There are two zeros there. One of them is negative one. Okay, I have a theory. Let's go back to the regular graph. Ah, uh, I love this stuff. Okay, I'm going to go to negative three on the left and positive 15 on the right and uh, negative five below and clear positive five above. Okay, this is definitely not positive 13, which is really what I kind of hoped for, because see, it's, it's, it's more like it's almost all the way to positive 15, but not quite. But we know now that here, right here, right there, this actually comes up above the x-axis and goes right down. So there are one, two, three, four zeros on the x-axis, which means they're real. And my hypothesis. Okay, first I'm going to put this, this graph. Actually, I need, no, I'll do it later. Um, I love this. I mean, you have to do discovery on this. I'm so excited, I can't remember what I want to do. All right, so step two. I'm going to put the graph here. Now, this, this right here is negative two. This is negative one, and it doesn't look like it's a zero the way it's graphed here, but we saw when I super enlarged it, 
that what we have happening is that. And then it goes way down. I don't know how far. And then it comes back up. So now that I know this, I can make my educated guess. Negative two and negative one, those are going to be my guesses for the rational zeros. There. All right, now we can do our um our thingamadoopy. And we still have time. Now we can do our um 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 synthetic division. I'm just so excited. Three. takes a lot to make me happy. Synthetic division. We're going to do synthetic division twice. Because we have to bring X to the fourth, down to X to the third, and then down again to X squared before we can use the quadratic formula. Or, you know, depending, maybe, maybe the square root principle. So now here we go, um, one minus 11. Well, let's see, negative two is my first guess. One negative 11. Negative 53, negative 67. Negative 26. All right, let's see if that's true. Negative one, negative 11, negative 53, negative 67, negative 26, yes. All right, now we can go fast on the rest. Bring down the one. One times negative two is negative two. Negative 11 plus negative two is negative 13. Negative 13 times negative 2 is positive 26. Please work, please work. Now that I'm begging, you understand. Uh, negative 53 plus 26. It's negative 27. Negative 27 times negative 2 is positive 54. Negative 13, positive 26, zero, woo! All right, this is x to the third, uh, x to the fourth, I'm sorry. This is one x to the fourth. We now have one x to the third. I'm going to try my other educated guess, or really big hope. Bring down my one. One times negative one is negative one. Negative 13 plus negative one is negative 14. Negative 14 times negative one is positive 14. Um, negative, uh, negative 27 plus 14 is negative 13. Negative 13 times negative one is positive 13. Negative 13 plus positive 13 is zero. Yay, these are rational zeros.
All right, now, what else? Here's what else. The quotient is 1x squared minus 14x minus 13 with remainder zero. We now are going to use the quadratic formula on that to find the other zeros. Is this step four? Yes. Okay, well, A is one. B is negative 14. C is negative 13. Almost done. So we're going to use the quadratic formula to find the other zeros. X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And that equals negative, negative 14 plus or minus the square root of negative 14 in parentheses squared minus four times one times negative 13 all over two times one. So that will be 14 plus or minus the square root of over two. Now let's see. Parentheses negative 14, parentheses close squared, minus four, parentheses one, parentheses negative 13. This time I get 248. So let me double check and make sure I put the right numbers in. Negative 14 squared minus four times one times negative 13. All right, 248. Now, I've got to break down 248 because we have to always simplify radicals. Uh, 248 is 2 times 124, and that's 2 times 62, All right? 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 4 is 8, 2 times 6 is 12, 2 times 2 is 4, and 62 is two times 31. So that's two times two times two times 31, which will give me two times two times two times 31. And I'm gonna double check and make sure that's right. Two times two times two times 31 is 248, yes. Okay, well, two times two is a perfect square. There are two of them after all. So we can make this equal four times 62. That's what I'm gonna do. The square root of four times 62, which will be 14 plus or minus the square root of four times the square root of 62 all over two.
which will be 14 plus or minus 2, because the square root of 4 is 2, times the square root of 62 over 2. Now we pull out a GCF because 2 will go into 14, and 2 is 2 times that. So 2 times 7 plus or minus the square root of 62 over 2 means that x equals 7 plus or minus the square root of 62. So these are going to be our other zeros. Put that on the last line here, unless I have room over here. The other zeros, let's write it over here. Other zeros are seven minus the square root of 62, and seven plus the square root of 62. Well, I don't need that. Um, yeah, that would definitely be the wrong answer. Let's write it again. Because it's certainly not a point. No, I need to draw the answer box. Well, it'll have to be black. OK, now. My rational zeros are negative 2 and negative 1. And I have irrational zeros, 7 minus the square root of 62 and 7 plus the square root of 62. So when I come back here to write this in factored form, I'll use my factor factory. F of X equals A times X minus C one times X minus C two times X minus C three times X minus Z four. A is 1, not always, but in this problem it is. X minus negative 2, X minus negative 1, X minus parentheses 7 minus the square root of 62, and x minus parentheses 7 plus the square root of 62. So, x plus 2 times x plus 1 times x minus 7 plus the square root of 62 times x minus 7 minus the square root of 62. And that I suppose would be step five. Write the function in factored form. Let's see, let's make sure. Yeah, this is step four. So this is step five. All right, we have done this. This took a lot more work. Graphing 
We had to get a close up on this. We had to extend the X axis in order to see that, that the other, other zero was there. Then we had to use synthetic division twice. I use negative two on the on the coefficients of the original function and then negative one on the quotient I got from that first synthetic division. Both of these were able to bring down X to the fourth to X to the third to X squared. I need to get the function down to x squared so that I can solve, I can solve it for the other zeros using one method or another. Okay. While we're at it, we might as well do another problem. Find as many factors of the polynomial as possible. It says the graph of the polynomial function is given to the right. On the basis of the graph, answer the following questions. Find as many factors of the polynomial as possible. And the way they want it written is just the factors with, with commas in between. So, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, we have negative four, negative two, one, two, three, four, five, and one. So the actual factors might be x minus negative four, x minus negative two, x minus positive five, and x minus positive one, and then clean it up. x plus four, x plus two, x minus five, and x minus one. Now construct a polynomial with the zeros of the graph. What they want is a polynomial with A equals one. However, uh, that is one polynomial you could construct. So it's not like it's wrong. It's just not the best one for this particular graph. But X plus four, X plus two, X minus five, and X minus one. Now here's here's what cinches it. C is it possible to find any other polynomial functions with the given zeros? Yes, an infinite number of other polynomials can be constructed using these factors, those zeros, because the changes would all be in the A. For instance, for this exact graph, 
A should not be one. Keep that in mind. There is a way to find it, but they don't ask us to do that. Yes, just by changing A. We'll even write that. Now D, is it possible to find any other polynomial functions with the given zeros and the same graph? No. Okay. I'm going to show you. Well, no, I'm going to show you on another graph because I don't want to mess you up on this homework problem. So I made another graph. My own homemade little special graph right here. we're going to find the equation of this exact graph. And here's how we're going to do it. This is negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 8. Ne a positive 1, positive 2. All right, so I'm going to start out with the factor factory. F of X equals A times X minus negative eight times X minus negative two times X minus positive two. Clean it up f of x equals a times x plus 8 times x plus 2 times x minus 2. Okay, now we're going to actually find out what a is. I'm going to show you how. Here we have a polynomial with an x-intercept of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. where that's five on the y-axis and zero on the x-axis. Okay, remembering that f of x is five, what I'm gonna do is this. If y is five, then x is zero, right? for this particular graph. If X is zero, then Y is five. I am going to put a zero in for every X. Zero plus eight. Zero plus two. Zero minus two. So five equals A times. 8 times 2 times negative 2. 5 equals A. That's 16, that's negative 32. Times negative 
32. I'll divide both sides by negative 32. Negative 32. And what I'm about to discover is that A equals negative 5 over 32. So if I want to write f of x in for this graph, for this exact graph in factored form, this is what it would be. This would be a times x plus 8 times x plus 2 times x minus 2. And then you can multiply it all together and find out what the polynomial is. Although I'm not that mean. Or am I? Now back here, if they had asked you to find the exact polynomial for this exact graph, not just for the graph that has the same zeros, but for this exact graph, we would have done what I did down there and put in this point, which stop and realize that this is 400. Each one of these little scale marks is 50. So this is 50, 100, 50, 200, 50, 300, 50, 400. So this is 100. This is 200. This is 300. This is the point zero two hundred fifty. We could find A for this graph using the method I used down here. And find the exact polynomial to meet uh, to match the graph. I just wanted to make sure that you know that. Okay, this is it. I will see you later. Bye.